to begin. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you to Freddie and the other organizers for inviting me. It's very nice to be in Les Uches. Um, and as, as you realized, I'm not going to give a training video on how to organize your desktop. <laughs> I'm going to give a... Um, Um, despite my, the disorganization of my de desktop, I'm going to try to give a seminar on the um, fluctuation dissipation theorem. So this is kind of um, a topic which I've been interested in over the last few years. Um, not really clear what progress I've made in this topic, but um, it's kind of an interesting one which um, you know, draws together different ideas and has some interesting possible applications. And um, I should say that this is, you know, I, I've talked, I've collaborated with Fennick Cooper on this topic, and I've also had lots of interesting conversations with Peter Hitchcock. And the other thing I should say here is that, um, you know, so I've just sp spent quite a lot of the last couple of years at um, in Toulouse, and I sort of should sort of acknowledge their support for my research over the last couple of years. Um, right. So this this is kind of motivation. So I'm, I imagine that. Um, in Ted Shepard's lectures, he talked about these sorts of problems. Um, so yeah, you could you could you could define something called the climate response problem. Um, yeah, you say I'm going to increase greenhouse gases by some amount, and um, how do different measures of the climate system change? And if you like, the kind of traditional historical focus has been on temperature. So that if you increase greenhouse gases, then you get you know, systematic increases in temperature, you get warming of the troposphere, you get cooling of the stratosphere. Um, and I guess one thing that's become of more interest recently is not just things like global average temperature, but also changes in circulation. And I'm told, I'm sure that Ted Shepard you know, talked about issues, changes in circulation and regional climate, etc. So in this kind of typical greenhouse gas increased experiment, not only was there an increase in temperature in the troposphere, but there was a change in the winds, the, you know, the colors of the change in the winds, the contours of the kind of climatological winds. This is a, a, a tropospheric view of the world, pressure, pressure coordinates, the stratosphere is kind of the, the top 10% of this picture. Um, but the basic story here is that you have subtropical Westly jets and um, under increased greenhouse gases, those are moving poleward. Okay, so the, there's a negative change in the wind at low latitudes on the s equatorward side of the jet, and there's a positive change on the poleward side of the jet. Um, now, of, co and of course, this is this is a longitudinal average picture, and what we we know is that um, you can't understand these sorts of changes simply by looking at a, a, a longitudinal average a dynamics which only only considers longitudinal average quantities you need to consider eddies you need to consider the fluctuations in longitude and in time to understand these sorts of changes um, I mean another example of this of this kind of problem how, how does the circulation change if you change something in the atmosphere is um, the response to stratospheric ozone depletion. So that about um, 15 years ago, people started to realize that um, there were changes in the circulation in the Southern Hemisphere, and um, you know, work by Thompson, Solomon, and Gillis and Thompson, and many others have kind of established how um, ozone depletion in the lower stratosphere in late, um, late in, in autumn in the, sorry, I mean in spring in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, um, leads to a change in the tropospheric flow. And um, these, are, these are examples from model simulations and from observations um, where one's looking at, um, this, these are differences in geopotential heights. In this case, observations, it's changes over a couple of decades between 1980 and 2000-ish. In this case, it's changes which are being driven in a model by an artificial depletion of ozone and therefore removal of radiative heating in the um, in the lower stratosphere, and um, you know th these these dynamical changes are associated with changes in the surface winds. So um, one gets an intensification and a um, poleward shift of the westerlies, okay, which can have implications for um, you know, rainfall, for example. So if you if you if you live in southern Australia and you rely on the, the, the prevailing westerlies 
to, to provide r rainfall, so to speak, then the, the poleward shift of the jet is going to change regional climate. So this is another example of we have a system, the tropospheric circulation, we apply a perturbation, we reduce ozone, we get a response. Um, another, another angle on this is solar cycle effects. Okay, So there's been a lot of interest over many decades in the possibility that the 11-year solar cycle may, the, the direct effects of which are only kind of plausibly felt in the upper atmosphere, perhaps at around 40 or 50 kilometers or above, might be somehow sort of transmitted to the lower stratosphere and to the troposphere. And this is um, some results from a sort of idealized set of experiments by Hague et al. again about 10 years ago, where they, they took a model tropospheric circulation and they simply applied a kind of warming, artificial warming in the stratosphere. And they um, asked how the circulation changed. And um, th the, these are the changes. Th this is now going from equator to North Pole, equator to North Pole. In, in these two experiments, you basically had a sort of uniform warming applied in the stratosphere. But in this case, it was five times larger than here. And um, again, well, the change here is manifested as a shift of the tropospheric jet. So that in this case, in fact, you, um, you have positive wind anomalies to the south of the position of the climatological jet and negative wind anomalies to the north. And yeah, what's kind of interesting is that the patterns in these two pictures look the same, broadly speaking. And indeed, they even kind of s almost scale with the amplitude of the perturbation. So it kind of suggests that some kind of linear theory m might explain this, this, these sorts of changes. Uh, of course, the question is, what sort of linear theory exactly? Um, so just to kind of remind, mind yourself, r remind you about the kind of worlds we're talking about here. I mean, in fact, I'm not really going to talk very much about stratospheric dynamics, but in in the stratosphere, we have this sort of large-scale circulation. We, I in the winter, we have a vortex. Um, the vortex is kind of dis displaced and distorted on the large scale. And in the troposphere, one has rather smaller scales. Th these, these pictures are potential tisty, and you know, one sees perturbations of the potential tisty field on scales of 1,000 kilometers or so. So we sort of think about planetary scale waves dominating the stratosphere and baroclinic waves, synoptic scale waves dominating in the troposphere. Um, but there is, yeah, there is modulation on the large scale as well, which is important. And in each case, there's, there's interaction between the mean flow and the eddies in the stratosphere between the mean flow and large scale Rossby waves, in the troposphere between the mean flow and synoptic scale eddies. And you know, these, these lead to important aspects of the dynamics. Um, in particular, in the troposphere, one thinks of the Interact two-way interaction between the mean flow and the synoptic scale eddies is leading to a sort of low frequency variability, which people call annular variability because it's typically associated with shifts in the position of the jet. Um, okay, so going back to the response problem, I mean, what's very clear is that if you're considering the response of the tropospheric circulation to something, then you need to take account of the effect of the eddies, the eddy fluxes. Um, and you know, that this, this, this is simply a, a kind of, the arrows here and the contours represent kind of standard diagnostics of the effects of the eddies, the potential effects of the eddies on the mean flow. So all this slide is saying really is that when you, you apply a forcing as a longitudinally symmetric forcing, you change the eddies, and the eddies are likely to have an effect on the mean flow. Um, now, the, the, so the challenge here is that this system is kind of tightly coupled. So, um, yeah, if we think if in, the, in the, the troposphere, one's got um, yeah, one's got moment, eddy momentum fluxes or a wave activity fluxes, or we, whatever you want to call them. Uh, you've got changes in the, z in the, in the average zonal wind. Um, you know, changes in the eddy fluxes are going to change the zonal wind. Changes in the zonal wind are going to change the eddy fluxes. So you've got a, a sort of rather sort of tight feedback loop here. Okay, and one of the challenges about the sort of experiments 
that I've you know, very quickly described, where typically one is applying some zonally symmetric perturbation to the to the stratosphere or perhaps to the troposphere, is that you know how do you how do you explain the response when you've got this kind of very tight coupling between the eddies and the mean flow? And if we take this paper by Simpson et al. as an example, I mean. Well, I'm not um, criticizing this work because this, this is important work and this is a difficult problem. But the fact is that um, in this paper, for example, I mean, they're applying some kind of changed temperature in the stratosphere. And then they're kind of saying, well, it looks like from the diagnostics that that's going to change the eddy fluxes. And therefore, we're kind of going to get the forcing into the system here. And then that's going to affect the mean circulation. That's going to affect the zonal wind. So they're sort of they're sort of rather, on the basis of empirical evidence and guesswork, they're kind of leaping into this feedback loop and saying this is the way to understand the response. Um, so the question really is, you know, can you really decompose this tropospheric box or do you just have to accept that all of these things are changing together? Um, one can make the same comment about you know, the ozone hole response problem, about you know, people, the effect of the stratosphere in general, applying stratospheric perturbations. Um, there are examples where people have perturbed surface friction and looked at the effect of that on the tropospheric circulation. There are cases where people have ap applied changes in tropospheric heating as a kind of simple representation of different sorts of greenhouse gas forcing. All of those have the same problem that um, you're applying a forcing what you want to know is how do these things change, right? But because these things are kind of tightly coupled, it's not really clear you know, where you get your forcing into this, f into this feedback loop. Um, there's a c you can say that people do experiments and they see a response and they can sort of post hoc explain that response. But in terms of making a prediction, that's not really not, not really clear that the skill is there to make the prediction. Of course, you, I mean, you can predict the, the, the change is being predicted by a model, but in terms of sort of theoretical me mechanical, fluid mechanical arguments, can you make a prediction? Um, this, this is just an, another example of, of how this sort of thing works. I mean, this is a paper by, by Chen et al. where they basically change the surface friction. So they have, they have a tropospheric circulation. They have a, some kind of value of a surface friction par parameter. They reduce the friction, OK? And then, so what there's a sort of, um, this, this is the, um, you know, the sort of upper level wind as a function of latitude. This is where you change the friction. So you sort of get a rather quick acceleration in the winds, as you might have expected, because you've reduced the friction. But then there's a sort of longer and slower adjustment to a new position of the jet. Okay, and, and that adjustment involves both the eddies and the mean flow in this sort of tightly coupled response. And again, I mean, Chenetel had a kind of complicated story about how this worked, okay? I mean, they had the same kind of feedback loop in the troposphere. But they sort of said, OK, well, we think that the surface friction is kind of getting into the system here. <laughs> it's changing the winds. Therefore, that changes the structure of the eddies. That changes the eddy momentum flux. But it, it's sort of, it's a po sort of post hoc description rather than a, um, a prediction made in advance. OK, now the, now the question that one, one is asking, yeah, what the question one would like to answer in these sorts of problems is um, what's the relation between the spatial pattern of the forcing and the amplitude of the response and the spatial pattern of the response okay you know we've seen examples where the, sh the jet shifts poleward we've seen examples where the jet shifts equatorward um, is there a kind of preferred response you know so that many forcings give similar patterns of response um, is there a sort of most effective forcing so if I have a certain amount of forcing can I sort of I put it in one place, do I get a bigger response than if I put it somewhere else? Um, you might also sort of think about the question of what you know what models do. I mean, if I if I take two models of the atmosphere, two climate models perhaps, um, you know, do 
do those model, how do those, the predictions made by those models r relate to each other? How do they relate to what the real atmosphere does? So, I mean, what I'm going to talk about is this sort of, um, it's almost a non-dynamical approach, right? <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's an approach, what, what one really wants to do is one wants to make a prediction of, of the troposphere response rather than doing an experiment and afterwards saying, oh, we sort of understand how this all works because we see the eddies change, we see the mean flow change. Um, okay, so this is where the fluctuation dissipation theorem comes in. So this is a kind of historical aside about what the fluctuation dissipation theorem is. Um, so this was a, a kind of, you know, one of Einstein's classic papers. Um, and it was about Brownian motion, essentially. And um, you know, he was considering the phenomenon of Brownian motion, which has been, had been identified previously. Um, so we have a, you know, a particle in, a, in some kind of liquid, and the, you know, the idea is that the molecules of the liquid are making collisions with the particle, and so what I see is that the particle executes some kind of random walk. And um, the random walk made by the particle, so let's say a sort of sphere, um, can be ex described by a diffusivity, okay? And the diffusivity is the, the mean square perturbation, mean, mean square velocity fluctuation multiplied by the correlation time of the velocity fluctuation. Um, so then Einstein kind of took various bits of physics and put them all together. And um, one piece of physics he used was from thermodynamics, the idea of equipartition of energy. And basically he said that um, the, um, you know, the, 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 the average kinetic energy of the sphere would be the same as the average kinetic energy of each of individual molecules, okay? And um, so that l led him to this expression for the um, kinetic energy of the sphere. And um, this, this is Avogadro's number here, right? So this is a kind of important number in physics which is appearing in this expression. Um, now, he, he, then, he then also used um, the Stokes law, you know, which had been uh, derived a few decades earlier, um, which was said that the um, you know, the, the force on a sphere in a viscous fluid um, is linearly proportional to the velocity, and in fact, it's um, it's actually the con the constant of proportionality is actually this this thing here, you know, involving the size of the sphere and the and the the viscosity of the fluid. Um, now, what in order to, to predict the diffusivity, okay, well, we've got the mean square velocity, but what we need is the correlation time for the velocity fluctuations. And um, Einstein um, you know, deri derived that by considering a simple kind of Langevin equation, um, saying, well, that's, uh, that's, this is the equation for the motion of the sphere. So the the mass times the acceleration of the sphere is equal to the minus the resistance force plus some kind of random force which is being exerted by the collisions of the molecules. We're gonna, we assume that this, this random force is delta correlated and that what that leads you to is the fact that the, the time correlation, I mean this is, this is the, you know, the lag covariance of the, of the velocity of the sphere is equal to the mean square velocity of the sphere multiplied by this exponential of in, in time difference and the time scale which appears here is um, m over ks so it's the mass of the sphere divided by the, the you know the, 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 the drag constant if you like um, so then Einstein put all this together and what what he found was an expression for the diffusivity um, in terms of you know well-known quantities like the gas constant temperature, the viscosity, the radius of the sphere, but also Avogadro's number, right? <laughs> so, the, so the kind of, one of the main big contributions of, of this piece of work was that you, you have a sort of macroscopic observable involving Avogadro's number. <laughs> so you can 
estimate Avogadro's number. And this was a time when actually the, the whole idea of you know, a, a sort of a particular, the atomic or molecular nature of matter was still quite controversial. So if you like displaying, <laughs> verifying this relation um, was a way of, of verifying the molecular theory of matter or whatever. So Einstein didn't get a Nobel Prize for this work, but someone else did later for you know, some kind of experimental continuation of this. So that's all kind of interesting, but then let's go back to the problem that we're interested in. Well, the important point here is that um, is this time scale of the fluctuations, okay? So that the time scale for the, for the, for the fluctuations in velocity is simply this um, mass divided by the resistance force. And this is basically the ratio of the velocity response to an applied force over an applied force, all right? So M and KS were first of all appearing in um, you know, the idea of a sphere moving s steadily with a, with a force exerted on it, <laughs> um, and are now appearing um, in an expression for the time scale of the fluctuations. So there's a, there's a relation here between a characteristic of the fluctuations and the dissipation of energy as expressed by the resistance force, by the rate of, of you, know, you, you apply a force on a sphere, um, you do work which is dissipated. Okay, hence the name fluctuation dissipation. But the important insight is that the correlation time for the fluctuations is given by the response of the system to an applied force divided by the applied force. Now, in the world that of climate response, all right, or any other response problem, actually, we um, we are interested in this quantity. We are we are interested in how much response you get for a given forcing. So the question then is, can we get insight into this thing by looking at the correlation time of the fluctuations? Um, okay, now let's sort of move viewpoint a bit. Um, if I'm thinking about, so, so that, you know, this, I'm now, th I'm thinking of the tropospheric system here as a chaotic system, okay? So it's, um, you know, it's, it's executing its random, quasi-random evolution. I can think of that as, you know, represented in some kind of phase space. Um, the position of the system in the phase space is represented by prob some probability density function. You know, if you like, the probability density function in the phase space is, is the climate. And um, so this is my undisturbed system, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some kind of forcing to this system. And of course, um, every individual trajectory will be affected by the forcing. <laughs> and um, correspondingly, the probability density function will also be affected by the forcing. So the question is, how does the probability density function change as a result of applying the forcing? Um, so, yeah, writing that mathematically, yeah, we're, con we're considering some kind of evolution equation in, in some kind of phase space. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we could imagine that the system is behaves kind of quasi-randomly because this is a non-linear function, <laughs> um, or else we could incorporate some kind of explicit randomness into this evolution equation. Um, we imagine that there's a probability density function which describes the equilibrium statistical pro properties. Um, we're going to perturb the evolution equation by applying a forcing term. And what's the new probability density function? I mean, one important point here is that, um, I mean, we in, in these systems, we, we expect that I mean, trajectories are going to be chaotic. So if we apply a small perturbation to the system, individual trajectories will eventually diverge, right? So individual trajectories will not be describable by some kind of linear theory. But um, on the other hand, the we might imagine that the, st the, the statistics of the system changes only weakly, so that we're applying a linear theory to the statistics, but not to individual trajectories, okay? And this is a subtlety which has been discussed yeah, in statistical physics, there's something called Van Kampen's objection, which was basically saying you can't apply, apply linear th theory to chaotic systems, right? Well, you can if you've provided that you, you 
take some kind of statistical average first. Um, okay, now the, so the so the kind of you know the key key step here is to sort of say we we wanted to do a problem where we were applying some kind of let's say steady forcing, but it could be a forcing that's a function of time. We're imagining we're describing this in terms of a linear theory, so let's consider a delta function ty in time forcing, and then superpose lots of delta functions. Now, if I um, you know as as we kind of all learn from studying differential equations, if I apply a delta function forcing to this, you know, in this equation, then the effect is basically to kind of shift the trajectory by a finite amount from before the delta function to after it, okay? So what that's essentially doing is, I mean, I'm starting off in a, in a si situation where the system is in its standard equilibrium statistics. <laughs> so let's imagine I've got many, 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 you know, many, many, many copies of the system, each doing its own thing. And then I apply the delta function forcing, and in each of those systems, the trajectory is displaced, okay, by an amount which is proportional to the forcing. And then I, again, take the average, <laughs> and I get the new probability density function. So the, you know, I'm, I just before the delta function forcing is applied, I've got the, the equilibrium probability density function. And then after the delta function f forcing is applied, I've got a new probability density function. And um, there's, there's probably a delta t missing here, but basically that's, um, you know, I can write down an expression for the new probability density function in terms of the old. There should be a delta t here. Um, so then if I now think about, th if I now think about a sort of observable of the system, so, um, some function, the, the average value of some function of x at time tor. Okay, I can write this down as, as this integral over the, um, the probability density function of the system just after time zero, and there's also a probability density function describing the evolution from the position at zero to the position at tor. Um, so this is now what I want, I w what I want to know is what is the change in the observable associated with the forcing. Okay, now you, so then, then you can kind of exploit an identity. Um, you know, this, this is an identity which holds for all phi and psi. It expresses this expect lagged expectation of the product of phi and psi in terms of, again, these conditional probability density functions and the, the sort of equilibrium probability density function and the function psi and the function phi. And you can choose a psi so that um, what you get is this expression here. And so what you, you can end up deducing is that the change in the observable is equal to this um, expectation Okay, and so this expectation is of phi evaluated at x of tor, and then this function evaluated at x of zero, right? So this is all about lagged correlations. And it's about lagged correlations in the equilibrium unforced, yeah, the, the unforced system. So this, so the, what you have here is an expression for the change in observable under the application of a delta function force in terms of lagged correlations evaluated for the unforced system. And then if you now do the integral in time, this leads you to the sort of simple form of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And so let's take a simple observable, which is just the change in the position, so to speak, in phase space. And that's, that change is, is a linear operator which is this operator here, acting on the forcing, and, it Im and th this and this linear operator involves lagged correlations evaluated in the unforced system. Okay, now the complicated. Th this this is a general expression. Okay, so it holds for all systems provided I know the probability density function rho. Um, there's a nice simplification that if rho is Gaussian, 
then um, this expression here reduces to essentially um, you know, some constant matrix times x of zero. And so in the special case that, that the probability density function is Gaussian, then what one has is that the change in x, the expectation of x, is given by this expression in terms of the covariance matrices. Okay, so one now has one's operator which takes you from the forcing to the change in the simple observable and the operator can be evaluated if you know these covariances for the unforced system. Um, now, in, in very crude terms, I mean, this, this, this thing here is a kind of time integral of a correlation function of a covariance divided by the, co by the variance, right? So this is, it's a sort of measure of memory time of the system. So the, the kind of very crude insight from this would be that the, um, the change in the observable is the, the correlation time or the perhaps the longest correlation time in the system because if you've got a system of many dimensions, you have many correlation times multiplied by the forcing, right? So this makes kind of intuitive sense. <laughs> Um, okay, so now the question is, well, can one um, apply this to the climate system? Okay, and there was a paper by um, Leith, I think, in 1975, which kind of proposed that the fluctuation dissipation theorem in, in its Gaussian form, because this is, this is the form which, you know, tends to be sort of mo most used in standard physics. Yeah. Uh, I'd find it helpful if you could turn to the problem you originally posed, which was breaking into this feedback loop. Is, is now a good time to discuss how this... Um, um, I'm how I think what I'm saying is that... Um, I mean, I'm breaking into the... The, the reason why people try to break into the feedback loop <laughs> is because they're trying to predict the response, right? So I'm, if you like, saying <laughs> breaking into the feedback loop isn't leading me anywhere. <laughs> Therefore, I'm going to try something different. Yes. Yeah. The, so the key, well, the key. So I mean, that's right. There's, there was a sort of break, right? I mean, I talked about something that was sort of recognizable atmospheric dynamics, right? <laughs> and then I've kind of stopped, and I've said this isn't going anywhere. <laughs> Let's, let's come from another direction. But later on, I will go back to the relation to atmospheric dynamics. So some people try to do this problem by using the adjoint of, um, um, of the Yeah, using adjoint, an adjoint model, that's right. And so it looks like those gradients of the probability function look a bit like the gradient of the... Um, it's not quite the same. Because yeah, I mean, so... so statistics, I but... Um, but one I could address the problem of what the response is to forcing by looking at the adjoint, and you will have um, then response yeah, to but whole forcing. Yeah, but a fundamental problem there is that the adjoint approach is based on linear linearization of individual trajectories, about individual trajectories. So if you have a world where, um, uh, if you have a chaotic system, then your linearization about individual trajectories is only going to work for a finite time. Okay, so that so there's you know there I, there is a fundamental technical problem with um, you could you could write down an expression for the response in terms of linearization about trajectories, but the problem is that you know the 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 the, the size of the of the things that you were trying to estimate would become larger and larger and larger. So you would have the kind of convergence problem. Okay, so that. That doesn't get you anywhere. It's a fundamentally time-limited problem. And I mean, there is, yeah, there are people who've tried to resolve that. I mean, there's, so there's a, I mean, some work by Maida and Abramoff have done something called blended response theory, right? Where they, um, where they basically use an adjoint approach. <laughs> essentially linearizing about trajectories um, for some time, 
And when they kind of hit the barrier, they then say, well, we're going to use some other approach to estimate the differences. Okay. You don't look convinced, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's, es it's essentially because your if you're in a chaotic system, your linearization would say that your, you know, your, your dis your di the distance from your, if you're thinking about separation of trajectories, the separation from the, the original tra between the original trajectory and the, and, the n and the perturbed trajectory becomes larger and larger and larger with time. Okay. So all the other quantities you're trying to estimate become larger and larger and larger with time. So therefore you get a sort of, you, know, you get a divergence. Okay, so people, people have tried to, to apply this approach in a serious way to the atmosphere. Just a question about the terminology. Wha what do you call a fluctuation dissipation theorem? Is a uh, ah right. Well, so so bo I, I bo am both I'm result here. Yeah, I'm, I'm 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 thinking of both of these as a fluc as fluctuation. Just they are two forms. This is the general form of a fluctuation dissipation theorem. Yes. And this is the form which is special to Gaussian systems. Okay. But sometimes this is um, this is sometimes called you know fluctuation response theorem, <laughs> and it's sometimes called linear response theory. I mean it's and th and the dissipation, I as I say, if you go back in the history, it all seems to be d to do with the fact that when you consider something like the resistance force on a sphere, it's associated with dissipation of energy, right? So you might say the dis the link to dissipation is a bit tenuous, particularly in the world of atmospheric. So we could call it fluctuation response theorem, <laughs> if you like, because that's got the two key words, fluctuation and response. Um, so the key, so the key, you know, the question is, can we apply this? And of course, the, then the issue is sort of practicality, because if you if you're sort of looking at some kind of s looking at the atmosphere or looking at a serious atmospheric model, then you you have a system with many degrees of freedom. Um, so you've got to, you know, you're you would be estimating these covariance matrices. So can you provide you know, good estimates of those from from some kind of given finite record of the system? Um, there's a, there's an inv inverse here, you know, which is problematic. Um, you've got to evaluate this time integral. So you've got to truncate the time integral in some way. Um, so the the issue comes down to sort of practicality. Um, so uh, this is work by Gritson and Brandstatter. So basically what they did was they ran an atmospheric general circulation model. Um, they sort of reduced the phase space to some extent, okay, to, to make the dimension of their phase space smaller, to make their calculations more tractable. Um, so they, when they calculated their, you know, their estimate of this fluctuation dissipation theorem operator, in other words, when, when they estimated this thing, they used um, you know, a, a sort of history of the unperturbed system from for four million days, right? Um, so that's quite a long time. I mean, so um, and then they compared against. So what? So then they're doing a set of experiments where actually they're applying a tropical heating and they're looking at the res the time average response to a steady tropical heating. And they're comparing the fluctuation dissipation estimate with the, um, you know, the estimate which comes from a long integration of a of a model with with the perturbation in it, as compared to a control simulation. And what you're seeing here is that um, so this is these are different measures of the response to the tropical heating. The, the, this, these are two different fields: at low level temperature and upper level stream function. The surface heat, the heating is applied here. Okay, this is this is the response as measured by the individual th by the AGCM integrations, and then this is the response as estimated by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. In this picture, and then th these these pictures correspond to a different location for the for the tropical heating. Um, so. You know, one looks at these pictures, and there are, you know, there are similarities and differences. Okay, so I mean, if I look at these two pictures, these two features, right, 
then I would say that um, the fluctuation dissipation theorem is doing a good job. But if I was to look down in this region, well, you know, perhaps it's not doing such a good job. Um, one might, you know, do the same <laughs> comparison with surface temperature. Again, so there are similarities and differences. There are, there are encouraging differences, but there are discouraging sim sorry, in encouraging similarities, but discouraging differences. It all depends on your point of view. Um, yeah. So the approach that they used was based on the um, calculating in the probability density, or just in individual no, trajectories, like you mentioned. No, in fact, they were they were as they were assuming the Gaussian form. Okay, so th so with the Gaussian form, they they don't need to well, they've assumed that rho is Gaussian, right? So what they need to do is calculate the covariance matrices. Um, Okay, now, so then here are some, some of their kind of quantitative measures of how well the two things agree. I mean, they have something called a pattern correlation, which I think are the, are the lines here, right? So, and the, these are for different locations of the tropical heating. So, yeah, this, this is sort of saying if I put my tropical heating at 60 degrees east, then I get a correlation between the pattern in the fluctuation dissipation prediction and the pattern from the explicit simulation of sort of somewhere, somewhat ab around 0.9 or something. On the other hand, if I go to some, put my heating in a different place, I get um, you know, a lower pattern correlation. But the pattern correlation is only part of the story because there's also an amplitude ratio, okay? And um, the numbers on this figure are pretty small, but yeah, the, the, the amplitude ratio is given by this, um, these values here as a function of position of the heating this is the value one, right? So you can see that for this experiment, you're kind of going between 0 0.7, 0 0.8 perhaps, and about 1.5. Um, there are other examples where you're perhaps looking at different fields or different um, spatial locations for the heating where um, yeah, you're getting much bigger variations in the amplitude ratio, okay? so. So if you thought, you know, if, you, if we focus on the gray bars, <laughs> you know, there's the value one. You know, well, well you're getting the right order of magnitude, <laughs> but if, you know, then, the, que then you, the question about good agreement is, well, do you think that you know, two is good agreement with one, right? It's sort of, <laughs> it depends what, you <laughs> what you're trying to do, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, um, Ring and Plum have also looked, so, so actually uh, one thing I should have said was that this Gritson and Brandstatter work, I mean, previously I'd sort of emphasized the problem of the change in the zonally average circulation in response to forcing. The Gritson and Brandstatter work is actually looking at longitudinal structures as, as well. Um, Ring and Plum looked at the sort of more zonal average picture. Again, well, they, they find Yeah, in a perf in a world where fluctuation dissipation was working, these three lines would have the same slope, right? <laughs> but they don't. So <laughs> the point is that when one tries to apply these the, 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 this this result, um, yeah, one gets order of magnitude agreement, but you know, significant numerical differences. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm going to come on to that. <laughs> um, It, it, it seems very reasonable that if the forcing is, you know, small enough, just make it small and small and smaller, eventually it's linear, and then there should be a linear response to the forcing, and you seem to have proved it, right? You've given us a, something which amounts to a formula which... Um, yes, that's right, and that's, I mean, so I think, it, it, I will, I'll sort of come on to talk about the various ways in which this might break down, right? I was going to say the only reason it fails is because the forcing isn't small or because... Well, so, so I, mean, I, I mean, so one reason why this might not work is if, you know, if we take an experiment like Gritson and Brandstatter's, might be, for example, that the, the forcing they've applied is not small in the sense that the change in the PDF of the system is small, 
Yeah. Um, so, in, I mean, in terms of practical issues, I mean, you, you've got to evaluate this operator. Um, yeah, as with all many degree of freedom systems, you might try to find a sort of optimal representation of the system. So you might, for example, use EOFs. So the, these are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrices as a basis. Um, y you've, y once you've chosen your basis, you've got to estimate this thing from the available data. So clearly, I mean, this, this, it's an ex this is a statistical estimate. You know, you have some finite time series for your system. You're, you're trying to make an estimate of this quantity. Um, this, this inverse is potentially ill-conditioned. Essentially, the co this, this is the covariance matrix, so the, so the parts of this matrix which correspond to um, small amplitude fluctuations give you a problem when you do the inverse. And uh, then obviously you've also got to think about the effect of this integration. Where do you truncate the integration? Um, so one can sort of illustrate some of these problems. I mean, this is for a, just a very simple system. Um, for example, if one, um, you know, he, this, 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 on this picture, this is the exact response. This, this is one variable in the system. <laughs> this, this is the exact response. Um, this is how the fluctuation dissipation estimate converges as you increase the length of the data set, okay? For each, yeah, each length of data set, one has to accept that for a given, you know, you've got a finite number of realizations and there is an uncertainty about your estimate, okay? So the, you, this, this is the, you've, you've taken a very, very large ensemble, you've taken the mean of that ensemble, that's kind of converging convincingly towards um, the exact value. But if you were to take individual sub-ensembles, then of course they would vary, okay? So that there's a, yeah, one could talk about um, you know, there's, a, there's a kind of bias and there's a, an uncertainty, if you like. Um, here, here's an example of the effect of, line of linearity or not. I mean, this, this is from, again, a simple circulation model. You've applied a forcing. So in this case, the, the background circulation is symmetric. This is the zonal wind. Um, you've applied a positive forcing in one hemisphere and a negative forcing in the other hemisphere. And then here is the opposite. Okay, now, it's, so if, if, you were in, if you were in a linear world, then the kind of response you see here should be the opposite of the response you see here. <laughs> but clearly, for this magnitude of forcing, it isn't. Um, on the other hand, if you reduce your forcing, then you can get into a more linear regime. Okay, so one has to check those sorts of things. Um, so, I mean, the point, point of this work was really to kind of look, try to look seriously at some of these kind of statistical issues about finiteness of data sets, varying the upper limit of the integral, and um, also varying the truncation, varying the number of EOFs you include in the representation. So, for example, th this, this, this picture shows the, the predicted response <laughs> um, as a function of the number of EOFs you include in your basis, right? And the message, and then again, this you know, the solid line is a mean over many many ensemb ensembles, and the grey lines are individual ensembles, right? So you, what you find is you include more as you include more EOFs, you get more and more uncertainty in your <laughs> estimate. So I think my, you know, my, the, the, the sort of message of this is that there, is, there are kind of practical statistical issues here, but um, there is still, the f you know, it, it's still s there is still evidence that you're not converging to the right answer. <laughs> okay, if we take this case, for example. You know, this, this was the right answer. You're apparently converging to this one here. Um, Okay, so, so then one question is, well, of course, you know, this, th th this, this approach has been based on the assumption that the system is Gaussian, but why should the probability density function of this model tropospheric circulation, or indeed the real tropospheric circulation, 
um, be Gaussian. Okay, if if you plot the PDF of a particular variable, you know, then for two different simulations, you know, here's one PDF, here's another PDF. I mean, are those are those Gaussian or not? I mean, they're, <laughs> they're clearly not exactly Gaussian. And if they're not, and then of course, if they're not exactly Gaussian, well, how much how much non-Gaussianity do you need to to disrupt your answer? Um, so this kind of motivated us to look for a, a non, you know, to try to use the non-Gaussian FDT. Okay, so the, if we go back to the the non-Gaussian expression, um, yeah, the, this 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 expression is 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 involved involves lagged covariances evaluated for the undisturbed system, right? But the difficulty is that this function is is an unknown function, right? It's got the probability density function in it. Okay. On the other hand, of course, if you've observed the system for a long time, you can estimate the probability density function. There are standard procedures for doing this. So the approach we took was to to use a kernel density estimator to estimate the probability density function and hence to evaluate, hence, you know, uh, estimate this thing. Okay. And again, one get yeah, you know, one has the usual practical issues associated with. Um, kernel density estimators that um, typically one is choosing a kernel function, one has to kind of choose a shape factor, and then the shape factor, <laughs> that was the, uh, the, uh, the shapes, the, the, the shape factor h, you might have to adjust as you in, in increase the number of observations in your, in your record. Um, So here, yeah, here's an example where the where the non-Gaussian approach work, works. I mean, so this this is a system, um, you know, simple equation driven by noise. The PDF looks like this. It's clearly not Gaussian. If you um, um, if you do a, again, look at look at this is a single variable representing the response. So so the the Gaussian estimate is up here, okay, and the actual response is here, and the non-Gaussian estimate matches the response, okay? So you've, you've sort of done the job in this very simple case. Um, can you go to a more complicated case? Well, I mean, we, we, th we, we tried this with a stochastic Lorentz model. Um, so again, this is another system which one feels, provided the sto stochasticity is not too strong, that should be strongly non-Gaussian. And one can get reasonable success with applying this non-Gaussian um, fluctuation dissipation with this system. Um, but this does actually leave the question of um, you know, what's a useful measure of non-Gaussianity, because um, you know, we can what one would really like is a, like is a quantitative measure of non-Gaussianity, which you can use as a basis for deciding whether or not the Gaussian approach is going to work or not. And actually, it's, that's kind of rather subtle because the, the difference between the, the complete operator and the Gaussian operator is expressed by this expression here. And um, this, this thing here is certainly non-zero if the system is non-Gaussian. But one also has to take into account sort of time correlations. So if the time correlations have a particularly simple structure where the expected value of x given at time tor is a linear function of the, ex of, the, of the value of x at time zero, then actually this thing disappears, right? So, so the, the appropriate measure of non-Gaussianity here can't just be determined by looking at the probability density function. One also has to look at some measure of the time correlations. So it must be almost time to finish. Um, so these are the kind of takeaway messages. Um, so potentially, the fluctuation dissipation theorem gives you some, you know, the response of, say, the troposphere to a forcing. Right? You've, if you've got the statistic, enough information on statistics of the unforced circulation, then you can predict the response to a, a forcing. I mean, actually, one of the kind of key insights, pr and perhaps you might say at the moment, the concrete insight is that um, the response to forcing is determined by the correlation time for the unforced variability. 
Okay, so what what that tells you is that if your if your model has the wrong time scale of its internal variability, then it will give you the wrong response to forcing. Right? And, that, and that's an important insight. Um, I mean, other messages, well, yeah, you, one can construct this response operator. Um, so, t so typically, I mean, this response operator will have a kind of leading singular vector, and for most forcings, the response will be, you will see the leading singular vector. But that leading singular vector is not necessarily the, the leading EOF. It's not the, sh the sort of shape of the largest variance in the system, and that's a sort of confusion that people have. Um, as I've said, I mean, perhaps, the, perhaps the, the most important insight that one has at the moment is that what's important is the time scale of variability. <laughs> I mean, I think the real question is, can the fluctuation dissipation theorem do better than that? Um, what, I mean, what would you, would you would like would be not only the relation to the time scale of the variability, but at least some kind of um, skill in relating the spatial structure of the forcing to the amplitude of the response, right? And it's not really clear that anyone has successfully used the FDT to do that. I guess that Gritson and Bransatter have made some progress. Um, there are various other things I could talk about, but um, I, th yeah, one, one, there are various future lines of work. I mean, one thing I feel that's been neglected is that in applying the FDT, you have to realize that this is fundamentally a problem in statistics, so that when you provide an answer using the FDT, you should be also estimating the bias and the uncertainty in the answer. That information should be kind of provided. I've shown that in principle there's a non-Gaussian extension, but there are big Im challenges in implementation. I mean, we implemented it for, for a three degree of freedom system. There's this something called the curse of dimensionality, which basically says that estimating the probability density function gets much, much, much harder as you go to larger and larger dimensions, okay? Um, you need to think quite carefully about truncation, actually. You can't simply truncate the system. It's not obvious you, s you get the right answer simply by truncating the system and looking at that. Um, so I, I sort of feel in some ways that there needs to be a clearer practical guide to implementation, a sort of user guide. You know, the big question is how long a data record do you need? How many degrees of freedom do you include? How do you do it? Um, but I mean, there are, there are, it does seem to be worth thinking more, more about this problem because the idea of a linear operator seems to be remarkably useful. I mean, I showed this example earlier of the, the Hague et al. experiments, you know, where you were getting the same, th this looks like a linear problem. You perturb the stratosphere by, by one here and by five here. You're getting a spatial structure of the response which is similar <laughs> and about five times as large, right? So, um, Another interesting sort of manifestation of this is that if you look at, this is from a review paper on the effect of the stratosphere on the troposphere in the extra tropics. If you kind of look at different measures of the effect of the stratosphere on the troposphere on different time scales, so this is, this is called a monthly response. What this, this actually is a, is a tropospheric signal following a sudden warming. Um, This is a seasonal response. I now have to remember what how that's different to the sudden warming one. <laughs> um, that's probably with some kind of radiative change. Um, this is a decadal response. This is this kind of solar cycle type response. Um, this is a cent centennial response. So this would be a kind of climate change response. Um, yeah, there is quite a lot of similarity in the patterns here. <laughs> okay, so so. It, you, know, you, you can the idea that some kind of linear theory is useful here and what you're seeing is the pattern of um, a preferred response is potentially useful and and the pattern of the preferred response is essentially determined by the tropospheric circulation so that um, you know for example the the pattern has a lot in climate terms, one would say that the pattern has a large component which is associated with the Atlantic Oscillation, 
that's determined by the tropospheric circulation. It's not determined by the details of where the forcing is applied in the stratosphere. Um, and then I could sort of finish on cultural differences. I mean, it seems, I mean, of course, the, the fluctuation dissipation theorem means different things to different people. I mean, so the, it's, I think in classical physics, you've typically been looking at very, very large systems and fluctuation dissipation theorem is essentially giving you a deterministic, an, you know, a number, right, which is describing this very, very large system. Um, you can use thermodynamics to give you explicit predictions. Um, in, the, in the world of dynamical systems, people are more interested in sort of formal justification of these theorems. You know, the question would be, does your probability density function really vary, vary smoothly as you apply small perturbations? Okay, actually, if, you know, if you look at very, very simple dynamical systems, um, you know, tent maps and things like this, then of course you can generate examples where the, where the, um, the PDF does not vary smoothly. But then you, then you might one might answer the question, well actually is that really relevant to the real atmosphere or ocean? I mean, in the world of climate or circulation, then you know, clearly what you can use fluctuation dissipation to evaluate your operator from a model simulation or from data. It's, it's a sort of problem in statistics um, so you need to know how much data is needed and how can you reduce dimensionality. But what you're not doing here is you're not, you know, you're not providing a sort of external theoretical prediction of the response operator. <laughs> you're taking a system and you're using the system itself to, to provide the response operator. Okay. Now you might say, well, is that worth doing? Well, I, but it, because it focuses on the relation between variability and response, I think it is a very valuable. You know, it says to you, if your system has the wrong variability, then you will get the wrong response. The the, then, of course, the dynamics comes. If it's like if you have a model which has the wrong variability, the question is, why does it have the wrong variability and how do I m improve it? Right? And the fluctuation dissipation theorem doesn't give you any insight into that. <laughs> But um, the simply making the link between variability and response is potentially useful. I'll stop. So, uh, if for the FTT, um, so if the FTT uh, can work, it seems the uh, forcing needs to be small. Do we have a good understanding about what kind of forcing can be considered small for the climate system? Well, I think that one, um, yeah, one one does by doing experiments. Um, so, you know, perhaps um, changing greenhouse gases over a hundred next hundred years is a small perturbation. Yeah, is a small perturbation in this sense okay um on the other hand perhaps if you if you quadruple or carbon dioxide then that, then that's that's not okay but i mean but, th but those are sorts of um that sort of information you can get from from experiments right so but i better say it's something i mean i would think of it as something you need to bear in mind when you are doing experiments um you showed these plots uh, where we had the true answer, uh, the true response of the system, and the the one uh, reconstructed with Gaussian um, FDT, and then the one where you used kernel density estimates. Yeah. And um, the very first plot you showed of that, it seemed to converge first and then diverge again. Yeah. So it c could you provide an explanation of why? Um, yeah. So which which curves are you talking about? The um. The uh, non-parametric estimate. Th th these ones. Yeah. yeah seems to converge and then divert somehow. Yeah, okay, that's right. So, so I mean, uh, this, this, was, this is a case where I was kind of going, rushing through material, right? But um, this is a good interesting thing to talk about. So basically what you're, for this curve, um, what you're plotting here is the, as a function of this um, sort of scale factor for the kernel density estimator. Okay, so if you've got, um, 
if you have a small scale factor for the kernel estima density estimator, then in principle you get um, an, un an unbiased result, <laughs> but, it may b but it has large uncertainty. Okay, and that's manifested by the fact that you've got a large distance between these two lines. Okay, um, as you increase the scale factor for the same length of data record, <laughs> okay, your uncertainty decreases, so these two dotted lines move together. But then you, at some point, start to introduce bias because basically you're trying to construct a PDF. You know, imagine you're trying to construct a PDF which has this scale in it using kernel density estimators which are made up of functions with this scale, right? You're clearly not going to get it right, so there's, there's a bias. Okay, so, so this is bias, <laughs> and this is uncertainty. Um, uh, so when you calculate the change in an observable, uh, when you show the formula, it's an ensemble average of the covariance matrices. Um, can you give an example of how exactly do you calculate, like, um, uh, yeah, um, I'm asking about, like, when you calculate, say, C, C tau. It's not shown here. Yeah. Next, Next one? Yeah. Yeah. So here, like, w what is tau is a time at get any given instant? Um, sorry, it's, so it's basically, so this, this thing, or let, let's focus on, no, actually, let's go to here, right? Thi so this, this is the state of the system at time tor. Okay, and then this is a function of the state of the system at time zero. Okay, so this is a, it's so this is a, and then I'm taking the expectation, so it's a kind of lag correlation. Okay, and then and then I'm integrating over tor, so I'm calculating a certain sort of lag correlation with lag tor, and then I'm integrating over tor. Um, so it's more that you've got, you know, you've, you've got sort of variability in time, okay? And your kind of, your tour is setting a distance between two times, and you're moving through the system, um, keeping tour the same, <laughs> and averaging the correlation between the value here and the value here, okay? And so that gives you th the value for a particular value of tour, and then you're integrating that over tor. Um, well, exactly, exactly. That's right. Yes, yeah. So, 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 th you know, this the, these would be th this. This is a covariance matrix, which is the matrix of covariance lagged co covariances between every pair of variables. Yeah, so in one of the first practical applications you mentioned by Grid Soon and Grinstead, uh, you mentioned that they needed um, to integrate the models for 4 million days. You yeah, that, so that's they estimated yes. the, they used 4 million day integration. And it's a bit of a surprising number <laughs> given that, for example, even in the observations to calculate the observed climatology, we don't have that number of days. So what does it really mean? Well, well, I, but I think, um, yeah, I think this huge number of days to get statistics doesn't it mean that the method is flowing in the first place? Um, yeah. So, I, if you like, what I'm saying is that um, um, what what I think is needed beyond, say, the Gritson and Brandstatter study is is more insight into, <laughs> you know, where does this number come from, and what do, w and what do you get if you reduce it. Know, when do you stop getting anything useful? So, so Gritson and Brandstatter, they do actually sort of say we have tested the, um, you know, they say we've test tested the sensitivity of results to reducing 4 million, okay? <laughs> and we find that they're very insensitive. <laughs> well, okay, in a way that's kind of reassuring, <laughs> but a more practical question might, might be, well, supposing I only used 100,000 days, right? <laughs> 
then do I get anything useful? So I sort of, you know, what I would like to have done myself but haven't quite managed yet, and, but it would be to sort of come up with a more sort of practical user guide, you know, given, given a system, given some s details of its behavior, can I say, you know, what useful information I can get for a given length of data record? About this uh, statistical problems, I, in many problems in, uh, in physics, people have not tried to compute the response from this uh, Kubo formula or from the, the other formula with the, log the logarithmic of the density, but they just computed the response directly from the definition, as, y as is done here, actually, in the, the intermediate plot. So th there is a real uh, question about why should you use something more complex than just computing the response by adding a forcing and computing the, uh, the response of the statistics? Um, y yeah, I mean, once again, I think that um, it's a sort of fair comment, right? If, if, you, if, 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 the, if, the, if the task you are setting is estimate the response operator, <laughs> right? And I go away and try and do it this method, and you go away and try and do it, you d and you do it by simply doing lots of false problems. I mean, you, know, you might well end up with a better answer more quickly, okay? Um, but again, we don't, you know, one doesn't, one doesn't know that, uh, that in advance. Um, but then, then the other thing one's looking for is kind of insight into how the system works. So your, your you know, th the, that approach wouldn't kind of reveal the link between the time scale of variability and the response to forcing, right? You would simply get an answer. Um, so, you know, I th there are kind of advantages to, to different, different approaches. So uh, another comment is that uh, uh, you, you have insisted on the what is called the static response, just looking at the the, f the final uh, yeah. value. But in the in one of the plots you have shown at the beginning, you were showing actually the temporal response. Uh, indeed, that's right. But I mean, one could. It's and so it, it's a fairly simple step to um, yeah to kind of modify this. Um, to give you a, te a temporal response, okay. I mean, you simply, I mean, ag again, you know, one, one simply is going back to the, um, you know, this, this, this is, this is the, the response to a delta function forcing. <laughs> then you're simply integ integrating this with a suitable weighting function in time to get the time evolving response. Um, but actually, actually, Bra I mean, Br Grant Brandstad has has kind of worked a bit more on that problem. Actually, um, I'm not sure if I understand that right, but so don't you have to make sure that the forcing that you apply at the second step actually exists in the internal variability? Otherwise, your response functions do not exist, right? Or they're not represented in your truncated EOF world. And the studies you showed, um, so the one we just were before the Christian thing, um, is an AGCM. So they have an anemia in the first place, basically, or not? So what was the last thing you said? Um, the the slide with the, with the eight panels, the one of the first where we've just been before, um, where you force with the anemia-like warmings, the circles in the tropics. Um, sorry, w you were looking. Am I going in the right direction? <laughs> I don't know. No, you don't, because <laughs> not in the beginning. Um, which which slide am I going to? A few further back. Further yeah, back. There you are. That's the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So. You mean this direction? <laughs> no. I just can't pronounce the name. The Grinston and Branstor. Grins Grinston, yeah. yeah. Okay, right, that one. Okay. There we are. Okay, yeah. so they try to force some El Nino-like stuff, right? Yeah. So, and does their control have a variability that captures El Nino is basically the question. question. If, the if the control run doesn't capture the forcing that you have later, how can it project 
accordingly. Um, yeah, well, I, I think yeah, the, the, the general point is a good one. I, I think I wouldn't worry too much about. Yeah, it's not talking about El Nino, right? Yeah, because yeah, that isn't really there in this model. Okay. Yeah, I'm heading to the general point. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 clear that one um, you you would have a problem in a sense, right? If you're if if some region had no variability, <laughs> and your um, and your forcing was applied in that region, something obviously goes wrong. Okay, but then. Um, you know, why, why should that, you know, are, are there regions that really have no variability? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, what, what I would, I mean, one, one thing that I would say, right, which is not necessarily agreeing or disagreeing, right, but sort of different, <laughs> is um, that it's kind of, one sort of imagines that if one is looking at, well, certainly if one is looking at the response in the tropics, <laughs> then one has, yeah, one would imagine that that depends on variability in the tropics, right? So if your model has the wrong variability, then <laughs> you will get the wrong response. Is that is that a, um, a compromised position? Um, well, no, but again, right, I mean, there's the question about, you know, how to understand the model response, right, <laughs> as opposed to the right response, is the, which is the response to the real atmosphere. So if the model has unrealistic variability, say, in the tropics, then the model will give you the wrong response in the tropics. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So may, may, may I make a, a last comment about uh, your is your slides about the history and maybe the different focus uh, during the last uh, century and uh, which one culture? Sorry, that's cultural right. one. <laughs> culture was a dangerous use. <laughs> Yes, so, so I, I think the, um, so what you call 20th century physics is uh, related to the green cubo formula. Yeah. And so uh, this is basically the, I guess, the middle of the 20th century, yeah. even before. And, and then uh, the formula you use with the, the, the gradient of the logarithm of rho divided by rho, so this formula has been written first by uh, Decker and Hacker, I think, in the 70s, in the context of the Fokker-Planck yeah. equation. Yeah. And then I guess what you mean here, dynamical systems, is uh, um, the works by Ruel and uh, collaborators about uh, just trying to justify this for yeah. deterministic uh, yeah. dynamical systems. This is, I mean, I guess that this is a slightly confused slide, right? But it's sort of partly prompted by the fact, well, the first thing would be that, like, when I, I remember once talking to about this not work to a, to a physicist, or someone I thought was a physicist. <laughs> and, um, and you know, I, I sort of, you know, I sort of said, you know, thinking about this formula, and the formula had explicit covariances in it. And his kind of reaction was, well, kind of, where's the, in, where's the interest in that, right? Because, it seemed to me he was coming from a world where he would be using, you know, thermodynamics or, or other physics to predict what those things were, okay? Hmm. Um, yes, in, in physics, for instance, they were shining light on liquids or any kinds of uh, materials, and then uh, th they were looking at the response, and then they knew how to relate the response to the transport coefficient, yeah, the viscosities yeah. and... and uh, also, their temporal behavior, the susceptibilities. So that's what w what it was used for, like actually, to measure the, the transport coefficient and the, the dynamical response. But, but I mean, I think it, it sort of it sort of comes down to what you know, what what can you get out of the application of the theory, right? So if if, so if people sort of thought, 
someone who came to this seminar and, and you know, thought I was going to provide the operator in terms of sort of some you know, geophysical parameters or something, <laughs> right, would, would go away disappointed, right? <laughs> what a waste of time, because <laughs> I didn't ever present an operator in terms of sort of external physical parameters. But, but, you know, but the operator does give you something. It gives you um, a way of interpreting responses of a system that you can observe. It highlights the link between um, variability and response. On the other hand, if, you t if I talk to a dynamical systems person, they'll say to me, oh, how do you know this operator exists? How do you know the changes are continuous, right? Well, I just, you know, <laughs> as a geophysicist, I kind of wrote just like to live in a world where I imagine things are continuous until I'm proven otherwise. <laughs> Whereas a mathematician sort of tends to want to live in a world where <laughs> things are assumed to be discontinuous until they're proven otherwise. I don't know. But, yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot yeah. for this very interesting talk. <laughs> <laughs>